is a war. A battle between nations. A clash of civilizations. Or is it an everyday struggle between factory owners and workers? Between peasants and aristocrats? Between those who give orders and those who carry them out? What if you could end a war not by some great victory, but by getting the workers who build the weapons, the farmers who grow the food, and the soldiers who fight the battles in every nation all over the world to stand up and say, enough, we refuse to do this any longer. This was precisely the dream which launched the Bolshevik party to power in Russia at the end of 1917. In this video, we'll explore how a ragtag group of Russians tried to force an end to the worst war in history by sparking a worldwide revolution. We'll talk about the Americans who were there at the time, and how their interactions with the Bolsheviks set the course for the rocky relationship between the US and the Soviet Union. And we'll see what happens when a movement takes power with the temerity to demand peace at all costs. In March of 1917, the Norwegian ocean liner Christiania Fjord was pulling out of New York Harbor. Its final destination was Petrograd, the capital of the Russian Empire. World War I was well into its fourth year, and Russia continued to supply the bulk of the troops on the Eastern Front. Russia had entered the war in 1914 as a patriotic crusade, led by their divinely ordained Tsar, Nicholas II heir to the 300-year-old House of Romanov. Allied with the great powers of Western Europe, Russia, the nation which had saved Europe from Napoleon in 1812, hoped to stand once again against a militaristic expansionist power, this time Germany. But this war was not like the Napoleonic Wars of old, and by 1917, Russia hung on by a threat. Nearly two million Russians were killed in the war, almost five million wounded. Life on the home front wasn't much better. War production squeezed the working class to the bone, and food shortages led to widespread famines. Weeks before the Christiania Fjord left New York Harbor, a bread riot in Petrograd, organized by female factory workers, had turned into a massive general strike that called for nothing less than the abdication of the Tsar who had led them into this tragedy. Unable to stop the force of discontent, the 300-year-old House of Romanov fell, and the first phase of the Russian Revolution began. The fall of the Romanov dynasty was seen as a disaster by many observers, but there were also many who saw it as an opportunity, a chance for an outdated, sluggish autocracy to finally leap into the modern era. The Christiania Fjord was filled with a litany of such people, dissidents who'd fallen on the wrong side of the monarchy and were forced to leave, outspoken political activists who'd run afoul of the Tsar's censors, liberals, socialists, anarchists, industrialists, bankers, aid workers, and even curious American journalists like muckraker Lincoln Steffens, who was on board and described the passenger manifest in his journal. The passenger list was long and mysterious. There was a Japanese revolutionist in my cabin. There were a lot of Dutch hurrying home from Java, the only innocent people aboard. The rest were war messengers, two from Wall Street to Germany, and spies and war businessmen, one war correspondent, no tourists. So many questions were yet to be answered for the new Russia. What kind of government would replace the monarchy? Who would lead the nation into the future? But the question that bugged the Western allies most of all 
was would Russia continue to fight in the war? Supplying most of the troops in the Eastern Front, Russia was key to keeping the Central Powers surrounded. If Russia left the war, it would free the Germans up to concentrate all their forces onto the Western Front. Perhaps of all the Western leaders who were sweating over Russia's commitment to stay in the war, none had more mixed feelings than American President Woodrow Wilson. On the one hand, Wilson was about to call for American troops to join the war. If the Russians left at the very moment the Americans arrived, this would make for an inauspicious start. On the other hand, the fall of the Romanov dynasty also provided a great deal of political convenience for President Wilson. He was going to pitch American involvement in the war as a crusade to save democracy. And with Russia seemingly liberalizing, it seemed like the winds of fate were behind Wilson's cause. Does not every American feel that assurance has been added to our hope for the future peace of the world by the wonderful and heartening things that have been happening within the last few weeks in Russia. The autocracy that crowned the summit of her political structure has been shaken off, and the great, generous Russian people have been added in all their naive majesty and might to the forces that are fighting for freedom in the world, for justice, and for peace. And so the American government poured all its efforts into supporting a new democratic Russia and making sure that whoever took power in Russia was not going to conclude a separate peace with Germany. In Petrograd, a provisional government under the leadership of Alexander Kerensky was assembled, and the American ambassador, David R. Francis, rushed to make the United States the first country to recognize it. The Committee on Public Information, Wilson's War Propaganda Task Force, doubled its efforts in Russia. A goodwill mission, headed by former Secretary of War Elihu Root, was dispatched to advise the new provisional government. A commission of railroad experts offered materials and training to help restructure and modernize Russia's rail transportation system. And the Red Cross sent aid workers, like Colonel Andrei Kalpashnikov, to help the Russians get back on their feet and onto the front. Kalpashnikov was on the Kristiany Fjord that day. He was a decorated veteran of the 1st Siberian Corps and a former attaché to the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. For the last year, he'd been traveling the U.S. delivering lectures and procuring relief funds for his home country. Now Andrei was returning home, and as per Russian tradition, he wasn't returning home empty-handed. Kalpashnikov had secured over 70 ambulances and over 30 trucks from the Ford Motor Company to be delivered to Petrograd for Russian relief. Like many on the ship that day, Kalpashnikov believed his actions could help save the Russian war effort and thus save the honor of Russia. As the Kristiany Fjord sailed along the eastern coast of the United States, it made a brief stop in Halifax, Canada. There, British customs agents boarded the ship to check for contraband, nothing out of the ordinary. Colonel Kalpashnikov was likely strolling the decks when an unusual group of officers approached him. They were looking for someone who spoke English and Russian to translate below decks. A few passengers had been detained for questioning. Kalpashnikov followed the officers down into a room where several passengers were being held on suspicion of carrying a sum of $10,000, collected in New York City for the purpose of engaging in anti-war agitation in Russia. Among those in detainment was an anti-war journalist and socialist agitator named Lev Davidovich Branstein. History would remember him as Leon Trotsky. Trotsky was in exile from four different countries, including Russia. And he had spent the better part of 1916 living in Brooklyn, writing for a socialist journal called Novoy Mir, or New World. Unlike many of the propagandists, aid workers, and reformists on the Kristiany Fjord that day, Trotsky was not returning to Russia in order to help the provisional government reorganize for a glorious return to the battlefield. He was returning to convince Russia to pull out of the war, though he was no peacenik himself. Trotsky was interested in fighting a war of a different kind. Not a war against a nation or an empire, but a war against capitalism itself, against the producers, the factory owners, 
the financiers, the wealthy profiteers who willingly sacrificed the lives of men in battle, only to reap the financial rewards of a war economy. With his virulent revolutionary stance, Trotsky had fallen under the watchful eye of British intelligence. In the bow of the ship, Trotsky was interrogated for hours and eventually arrested. By some accounts, he was forcibly taken off the ship at gunpoint along with his wife and children and thrown in a Canadian jail. There he languished for several months until friends finally secured his release in May and he was able to head to Petrograd. Disgusted by the incident, Trotsky never forgot about Colonel Kalpashnikov and the assistance he provided to the officers who arrested him. On the other side of the world, an American aid worker was stepping off a ship at the Russian port of Vladivostok. His name was Raymond Robbins. Tall, built, with a powerful speaking voice, Robbins was a product of the American progressive movement. In his youth, he'd had adventures searching for gold in Alaska, then became an evangelical minister when he failed to strike it rich. Later, as a labor leader in Chicago, Robbins came to understand the working class struggle, though he didn't share Trotsky's radical anti-war views. When the U.S. declared war on Germany, Robbins worked to organize a brigade to be commanded by his close friend, former President Theodore Roosevelt. Perhaps eager to prevent a political opponent from taking away the spotlight during the war, President Wilson denied Roosevelt his brigade and forced him to remain on the home front, much to the ex-Rough Riders' dismay. However, Robbins' organizational skills did not go unnoticed by the Wilson administration, and on Roosevelt's recommendation, he was sent to Russia to help head up the American Red Cross mission in Petrograd. Robbins traveled across the Pacific to Vladivostok, where he would take a nine-day trip across Siberia toward the Russian capital. Robbins had come to Russia to support the provisional government and give Russia the aid it needed to return to the front. But as he made his way by train across the broad landscapes of Siberia, a much different picture was beginning to shape up. In many of the towns where the train made its stops, large hostile crowds gathered chanting death to capitalism and other anti-war slogans. Robbins quickly noticed that the provisional government enjoyed almost no support or representation in Russia's heartland. What did enjoy support were the workers' Soviets, self-organizing democratic bodies of peasants, soldiers, and workers. The Soviets elected representatives from all stripes of political activism, but Robbins noticed the growing popularity of a militant leftist party called the Bolsheviks. Traveling from town to town, Robbins would have witnessed scenes much like those recounted by radical American journalist John Reed in his account of the Russian Revolution, 10 Days That Shook the World. Comrades, civil war has come. The first question must be a peaceful settlement of the crisis. The army committees consider the taking of power by the Soviets to be a stab in the back of the army and a crime against the people. You lie! Who are you speaking for? Who do you represent? The Central Executive Committee of the Soviet. And we disclaim all responsibility for what has happened. You speak for the officers, not for the army. I appeal to all reasonable soldiers to leave this Congress. Kermilovists, counter-revolutionists, provocateur. It's easy to see that in an atmosphere like this, Robbins would have his work cut out for him. In Petrograd, the provisional government was holding strong though it was dominated by conservatives, aristocrats, and various other reactionaries who were beginning to think it was high time this revolution came to an end and order be restored. Some voices even called for a military coup. As Robin's train pulled into the Russian capital, he was shocked to see the sentiment dominating among the American embassy staff as well. He soon came to call such reactionary views indoor opinions beliefs cultivated in the rarefied atmosphere of U.S. Embassy culture. I live in the embassy and since the beginning of the revolution have not left it except to attend a meeting of the diplomatic corps and to take an occasional walk after dark. And contrasted them with his own outdoor opinions, gathered from real experience with the grassroots of Russian society, 
where Bolshevism was thriving. Many believe the Bolsheviks are German agents, thieves, and murderers. Suppose they are. In Chicago, I've worked with folks, and there was no one in Smolny any crookeder than some of them. As rumors of a march of counter-revolutionary forces toward Petrograd grew by the day, the desperate Kedinsky made an alliance with the Bolsheviks, releasing many from prison and allowing them access to arms. The coup ultimately never came, and instead, Kedinsky succeeded in putting the Bolsheviks in the perfect position to seize power, which they did on November 7th. The journalist and political agitator Vladimir Lenin was placed at the head of the entire Russian Empire, and Trotsky, the anti-war socialist agitator who'd been languishing in a Halifax jail only months earlier, was appointed Commissar of Foreign Affairs for all of Russia. Entering his new office at the Smolny Institute, formerly an elite school for girls, he joked, What sort of diplomatic work will we be doing anyway? I shall issue a few revolutionary proclamations to the people, and then close up shop. Truly, Trotsky's job would require more than a few proclamations. Nonetheless, the proclamations regularly came. The Bolsheviks had built their power on a promise of peace, land, and bread. And it would be Trotsky's task, as foreign minister, to ensure the timely completion of the first. Reveling in the workers' uprising, which was overthrowing Russia's own war machine, the Bolsheviks believed they could end the war by triggering similar revolutions in other warring countries. And why not? Germany was in just as bad of shape as Russia by this point. France was in shambles. Trotsky had even witnessed massive bread riots in New York City. Perhaps World War I was the spark needed to light a worldwide revolution. One of Trotsky's first steps would be to shift the narrative of the war propaganda by exposing the truth behind the so-called patriotic crusade of the Allies. Days after taking office, he leaked a series of secret treaties concluded among the Allied powers at the start of the war, in which England, France, Italy, and Russia had agreed on how to divide up the spoils of their future territorial conquests after defeating Germany. Suddenly, a war that was presented as a battle of good versus evil was looking more like a poor man's fight for a rich man's benefit. Although the publication of the secret treaties caused a sensation, the revolutions Trotsky hoped it would cause did not readily come. Much like the recent leak of the Afghan papers did not stop the Afghan war, and much like the leak of the Pentagon papers in the 1970s failed to stop the Vietnam war, so did the news of the secret treaties fail to overthrow the capitalist governments of Europe and America and end World War I. The action did, however, create a deep resentment among the Allies for the new Soviet government, which would make any future collaboration impossible in their eyes. Ambassador Francis's opinion of the new government left no room for future relations. Whatever sympathies for the Bolsheviki, I shall never recognize them nor have anything to do with these murderers. If ever the United States recognizes this anti-democratic party, probably it will only be after I have resigned. Without any recourse to communicate with the American government, Trotsky faced the possibility of a permanent breaking off of diplomacy with the West. That is, until he was paid a visit by Raymond Robbins. Robbins arrived at the Smolny Institute days after the Bolshevik uprising, having arranged a meeting with Commissar Trotsky. As he entered the building, he was recognized by a guard who began shouting, Counter-revolutionist! Kedinsky! Robbins approached the soldier, and communicating through an interpreter, replied, I was for Kerensky. I came here to serve my government and help the Russian people, and I found Minister President Kerensky at the head of the Russian government. I know a corpse when I see one, and the thing to do with the corpse is to bury it. Tell the commissioner that so far as I know his program, I am against it but I am not going to interfere in the domestic affairs of Russia." Robbins was admitted to see Trotsky, and from this moment on, he became one of the few channels of diplomatic communication between the United States and the new Soviet Union. Trotsky and Robbins discussed the role the Red Cross would play in the coming months as the Russian Revolution entered its new phase. Trotsky agreed to allow Robbins to continue his activities on a promise that the Red Cross would not interfere with Russia's internal affairs. As one of the few Americans who recognized the Soviet takeover was more than a brief adventure, Robbins agreed 
but asked for a show of good faith. To prove the Bolsheviks would support the Red Cross's work, he requested Trotsky allow a shipment of 32 cars of supplies to be moved by train to Yasi, Romania. Yasi was one of the easternmost cities of Romania, where the Romanian government had been pushed to the very edge by the continuing attacks of German soldiers across their land. The successful crossing of American goods over 1,500 miles of Russian territory unharmed would further serve as proof to Robbins that the Soviets really did have control of this country. Trotsky agreed, and soon the trains were on their way. As the supplies moved southwards, another representative of the Red Cross was making his way back to Petrograd from Yasi. Colonel Andrei Kalpashnikov, who had months earlier organized the transport of 72 Ford ambulances to Petrograd, decided to return to the Russian capital after news of the Bolshevik Revolution reached his post. All along the way, Kalpashnikov passed by the Russian lines, where soldiers were mutinying and crossing no man's land to fraternize openly with the Germans. Unwilling to wait for a formal armistice, Commissar Lenin had opted to direct soldiers at the front to organize Soviets, elect communist leaders, and fire or execute officers who insisted on continuing the fight against the Germans. From Lenin's perspective, the unbelievable events taking place in the Russian trenches was only the beginning of a worldwide revolution. Officers like Kalpashnikov could not share in Lenin's grand vision, however. For him, as for many others, the defection and mutiny of Russian troops amounted to nothing less than treason and national disgrace. Adding to their worries were recent declarations from the Soviet Foreign Office. Soldiers, workers, peasants, your Soviet government will not allow the foreign bourgeoisie to wield a club over your head and drive you into the slaughter again. Do not be afraid of them. Let all know that the soldiers, workers, and peasants of Russia did not overthrow the governments of the Tsar and Kerensky just to become cannon fodder to the Allied imperialists. Imagine what it must have been like for the Allies to read a statement like that coming from the official diplomatic organ of the new Soviet government. In mid-December, an armistice was reached between Russia and the Central Powers, and peace negotiations were set to begin at Brest-Litovsk. With Russia seemingly backing out of the war, Colonel Kolpashnikov hatched a plan to move his trucks and ambulances to Yasi, where the Romanians, still struggling against the German army, could make use of them. A series of telegrams went back and forth between Colonel Anderson, the American representative in Yasi, and Kolpashnikov in Petrograd, talking about sending the ambulances down to Romania. In one of Colonel Anderson's telegrams, he suggested that the supply train be diverted through a town called rastov na -Danu. At the time, the town of rastov na -Danu was a stronghold for a counter-revolutionary force led by a Cossack officer named General Kaledin. The telegrams were of course intercepted by Bolsheviks, who had seized power in part by taking control of the telegraph wires. And when they did, red flags immediately went up. The fact that the American Red Cross might be planning to send ambulances in that direction seemed very fishy to the Soviet representatives in Petrograd. News of this plan soon reached Commissar Trotsky, and as he was reviewing the evidence, he noticed a familiar name, Kalpashnikov, the same officer who was on the Kristiani Fjord the day the British interrogated Trotsky. It was all too perfect not to be true. Fearing for his life, Kalpashnikov went to Raymond Robbins, asking for help, but after explaining his situation, found that Robbins took the side of the Bolsheviks and believed the accusations against Kalpashnikov. Shocked by this response, Colonel Kalpashnikov headed to the American embassy to talk to Ambassador Francis. Francis was more amenable to Colonel Kalpashnikov's complaints and seemed to even believe that this whole affair was simply a conspiracy to oust him as ambassador and replace him with the more Bolshevik-friendly Robbins. Historians don't seem to agree on which version of the story is correct. The whole thing may have been one giant misunderstanding. No one knows for sure. All we do know is that Kalpashnikov was arrested and thrown in Peter Paul Fortress. It wasn't long before Trotsky spoke out on the incident, at a large meeting at Alexandrovsky Theater. There are threats here uncovered going from Kalpashnikov to Anderson, and probably quite by chance from Anderson to Ambassador Francis. 
This Sir Francis will have to break his golden silence, which has remained unbroken since the revolution. Such things as the bribing of a Russian colonel to help Kaladin shall not repeat themselves. Let them understand that from the moment that they interfere with our internal strife, they cease to be diplomatic representatives. They are private counter-revolutionist adventurers, and the heavy hand of the revolution will fall upon their heads! In the revolutionary atmosphere of the time, such words were more than criticism. They could easily lead to vigilante violence against the American embassy, as they would years later in Tehran during the Iranian revolution. Faced with possible disaster, Colonel Robbins rushed to see Commissar Lenin. After assuring the Bolshevik leader he could get things back under control, the threats against the embassy died down. Still, the Kalpashnikov affair created suspicion between the U.S. diplomatic staff and the new Russian government that would set an ugly tone for the future. The Americans in Petrograd were beginning to understand the Bolsheviks were more than a passing phase, and they soon began shifting their efforts away from undermining Soviet power toward trying to coax them back into joining the war. Ambassador Francis soon cabled to Washington. The tired people of this country will not fight for territory, but they will possibly struggle for a democratic peace, for the fruits of revolution, if appealed to by a country whose unselfish motives they recognize. Back in Washington, advisors to President Wilson began urging him to address events in Russia publicly. It had been nine months since Wilson's blockbuster war declaration speech, with its high-minded call to fight for democracy around the world. Over the past few weeks, the spotlight had been completely stolen by the unprecedented events in Russia. The uprising of worker Soviets, the refusals to fight in a cursed war, the publication of the secret allied treaties, and the open call for a peace based on no annexations and no indemnities. In light of all this, advisors to the president, including Edgar Sasson from the Committee of Public Information, urged him to speak out. If president will restate anti-imperialistic war aims and democratic peace requisites of America, thousand words or less, short, almost placard paragraphs, short sentence, I can get it fed into Germany in great quantities in German translation and can utilize Russian version potently in army and everywhere. Wilson soon got to work. After all, the Bolsheviks were on their way to winning the propaganda war, at the very moment American troops were arriving in France to take up the Allied cause. In a speech before the Soviet, Commissar Trotsky had even called out Wilson by name. The United States began to intervene in the war after three years under the influence of the sober calculations of the American stock exchange. Apart from that, American war industry is interested in war. During the war, American exports have more than doubled and have reached a figure not reached by any other capitalist state. When in January, Germany came out for unrestricted U-boat warfare, the finance capitalists sent an ultimatum to Wilson to secure the sale of the output of the war industries with the country. Wilson accepted the ultimatum and hence the preparation for war and war itself. In the eyes of Bolshevik propaganda, Wilson was nothing less than a representative of capitalist interests, and his promise to make the world safe for democracy lost much of its shine compared to the Bolshevik vision of an international working class revolution. Acting on the advice of cabinet officials and other advisors, Wilson called Congress in for a special session on January 8, 1918, to further elaborate on the U.S. mission in Europe. In a two-hour speech, Wilson laid out his plan for a peace in 14 points. He echoed the Bolshevik call for no treaties and no indemnities, except for the return of Alsace-Lorraine to France. He called for a redrawing of Europe's map, once dominated by empires, to include new nations based on self-determination of people. He called for free and open trade on the seas, and an evacuation of all territories which belonged to Russia before the war. And in his final point, he announced his commitment to the creation of a worldwide League of Nations, a precursor to the modern United Nations, where countries could openly discuss their problems rather than resort to the secret treaties which caused the war in the first place. Wilson's vision was ultimately a more conservative one than the Bolshevik program, 
retaining nationalism as the standard organizational form, rather than an international consortium of workers. With the whole world looking toward the United States, Wilson did not miss the opportunity to comment on the situation in Russia. There is, moreover, a voice calling for these definitions of principle and of purpose, which is, it seems to me, more thrilling and more compelling than any of the many moving voices with which the troubled air of the world is filled. It is the voice of the Russian people. Whether their present leaders believe it or not, it is our heartfelt desire and hope that some way may be opened whereby we may be privileged to assist the people of Russia to attain their utmost hope of liberty and ordered peace. Wilson's 14 points was the next salvo in what would become an ongoing propaganda war between two competing visions of a new world order. Lenin was reportedly impressed with the speech and began working with the Red Cross and the Committee on Public Information to disseminate copies of the 14-point speech across the Russian front. Still, it would do little to change Russia's determination to exit the war by any means necessary. The day after Wilson's speech, Commissar Trotsky arrived in Brest-Litovsk to hold peace talks with the Germans. As the negotiations unfolded, Trotsky found that Soviet Russia was in an unusually weak negotiating position. For one thing, taking Russia out of the war was the basis for the Bolshevik mandate to power, which meant Trotsky couldn't reasonably threaten a resumption of hostilities if the terms of the treaty were unfavorable, without risking the overthrow of his own governing coalition. For another thing, in their attempt to stop the war, the Bolsheviks had undermined their own army's discipline structure, encouraging soldiers to arrest and execute officers and desert their positions. So even if they wanted to threaten the Germans with a resumption of hostilities, they couldn't. Additionally, counter-revolutionary forces were gathering steam all across Russia. The Germans could leverage a potential alliance with General Kaledin, for example, in Ukraine, if the Bolsheviks were unwilling to play ball. And lastly, the German army itself was within miles of the Russian capital. So the successful conclusion of this treaty was literally a matter of life and death. Now, you might be asking yourselves why the Bolsheviks would seemingly do everything in their power to weaken their own negotiating position. But when you consider the unprecedented nature of World War I, and how awful life had become across Europe, it's not hard to see why the Bolsheviks believed worldwide revolution was going to take place at any moment. Hoping for such an outcome, Trotsky stalled at the negotiations in Brest-Litovsk, delivering long, drawn-out speeches and making absurd requests, hoping the delay would give German revolutionaries time to overthrow their own government before Russia was forced to sign a punitive peace with Germany. But Trotsky could only carry on the charade for so long before the Germans lost their patience. If Trotsky didn't stop this foolishness and sign a peace right away, the Germans would march on Petrograd. Word of the German threats of attack soon reached the Russian capital and caused a panic. A mob of dissatisfied soldiers and sailors congregated outside the Smolny, demanding an audience with Lenin, who it was rumored had run away to Finland. The Bolshevik movement was reaching a crisis point. Lenin entreated the angry crowd outside the Smolny to come inside and gather in his small office. Some 30 or 40 of them came in, dressed in civilian clothes and brandishing rifles. Lenin stood before them, hands characteristically stuffed in his pockets, his strong forehead protruding over his focused, totter eyes. Comrades, I have not run away. I don't blame you for being confused, for mistrusting me. This is hard times for Russia. We all die in the struggle, but let us die for revolution and not against it, comrades. We will make peace with the German robbers. We will make peace with the German thieves. We will make any kind of peace. They say to you that Comrade Lenin will make a shameful peace, and I will. They say to you that I will give up the imperial city of your home, and I will. They say to you, I will give up the holy city, the Kremlin, Moscow, and I will. We will go further east and carry the flame of revolution there. And we will keep it burning 
until their comrades revolt against their masters in Berlin and Vienna by a proletarian revolution. The crowd dispersed to shouts of Hail Lenin, but the crisis still continued. Threats of a German attack still loomed large over the Russian capital. So the Soviet government packed up shop and moved further into the interior, to Moscow, which remains the capital of Russia to this day. As the Russian situation grew ever more critical, and the revolutions Lenin hoped for seemed not to be coming, he ordered Trotsky to sign a treaty with the Germans on any terms. On March 3rd, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed. Russia ceded some 1 million square miles of territory to Germany, losing 34% of its population. The land lost included 54% of Russia's industrial land, almost 90% of its coal fields, and a quarter of its railways. One of the former Tsarist generals who accompanied Trotsky on the mission, Vladimir Skalon, was so ashamed of the terms, he committed suicide. The treaty's terms were a heavy price to pay for peace, but one well worth it for the Bolsheviks. The next years would bring a civil war even more costly than the World War which had preceded it. And only with the Germans gone could the Bolsheviks have succeeded in maintaining power. Despite the fact that Lenin had ordered the signing, most of the Soviet officials who were involved in the negotiations at Brest-Litovsk were later purged under Lenin's successor, Joseph Stalin, including Commissar Trotsky. As for the American troops, they'd arrived about just in time for Germany to renew its assault on the Western Front. Free of conflict in the East, the Germans launched the spring offensives, which would become some of the worst fighting in the entire war. The U.S. would give up over 100,000 of its sons on the battlefield of Europe. Still, this number pales in comparison to the millions lost in France, Russia, and Germany. When the war finally did come to an end, it was Wilson, rather than the Bolsheviks, who set the terms for the peace. Though when the Treaty of Versailles was finally signed, it included little of what the American president had proposed. Kalpashnikov remained in prison until May of 1918, when he was released and made a hasty escape to the United States. There, he married his American sweetheart and described his experiences with the Bolsheviks in a book called A Prisoner of Trotsky's. The foreword to this book was written by none other than Ambassador David R. Francis, who left Russia in 1918 after the Soviets expelled U.S. diplomats from Russian territory. Francis's words give us a clear sense for an attitude toward the Soviet Union which would prevail in American foreign policy for the coming decades. I have written this foreword through a desire to do all in my power to aid a patriotic and intelligent Russian who has served his country well and is not despairing of his people eventually ridding Russia of Bolshevism, which is not only a disgrace to any country it dominates, but is antagonistic to all organized government everywhere and an enemy to society itself. Raymond Robbins also returned to the U.S. around the same time as Francis, though with a much different attitude. Believing the future for U.S.-Soviet relations lie in cooperation rather than antagonism, Robbins gave testimony before a Senate committee in 1919. What Robbins would once call his outdoor opinion was destined to become a minority view in how the United States should conduct itself toward the Soviet Union. I believe the best answer to Bolshevik Russia is economic cooperation, food, and friendliness on the part of America. That would help us help Russia and operate this country to weaken the authority and power of Bolshevism. It is the Bolshevik formula which I consider economically impossible and morally wrong. But I have, for the Soviet form of government, only the interest of an experiment, at once tremendously vital in Russia and possibly useful in the history of human progress. Many historians believe that cooperation between the world's two emerging superpowers of the 20th century was impossible from the outset. But perhaps, just perhaps, if the US government had listened to Robbins, the history of this planet could have been much, much different.